नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस the indian government fundamentally believes that data is a national asset uh we've heard you know ministers and people talk about uh, data is a new oil you heard everyone from nandan dilikani who who talked about india being a data rich country before it is an economically rich country you had mukesh ambani talk about data as being the new oil and so i i think there is this fundamental idea that data is critical to india's economic growth and therefore we need to make sure that it gets leveraged for economic growth and privacy essentially becomes antithetical to that it becomes adversarial with this particular aspect what is data and why is it important that citizens have a right to privacy over it as it turns out we are data digital rights activist journalist and founder of media nama nikhil pahwa in this conversation with financial journalist mitali mukherji gives us a one on one on the concept of data privacy can one look at data from the perspective of a right and how is it connected to the freedom of expression while understanding how and how much data can possibly be collected about one person is in itself mind boggling This episode gives us an insight into the three important aspects of data within the Indian context: privacy, security, and governance. With economic growth taking a central role and data being compared to oil as a national asset, data protection rights and privacy are seen as an obstruction, therefore leaving us with the question: is privacy a fundamental right? And now over to mitali when i was asked to have a discussion around data privacy frankly i was i was wondering how we could squeeze such a giant topic into 40 minutes or 45 minutes and really to to explain it in one line it's an issue that touches almost every aspect of our lives and in that and i don't mean this in a dramatic fashion i think it's it's almost the best of times and the worst of times it's the best of times because there are folks like my guest nikhil pawa and uh, many others doing such seminal work on data privacy and data rights and as we will peel away in this conversation i think it's also the worst of times because it's probably a new low in terms of the unbridled attack on personal data and how it's been manipulated nikhil pawa is of course a digital rights activist he's the founder of media nama and he's been looking at all things tech and tech policy for a long long time now nikhil great to have you here and i'm really looking forward to our chat thought we could do like you know the mini stepping stones and then the big ones nikhil because for a lot of people i think it's an amorphous term you know what is data privacy so if you think about it uh, mitali um, data privacy has three different parts to it uh, one is this idea of privacy as a right which is that we have the right to informational self determination and to determine what happens with our data and it's fundamental to protecting ourselves in terms of if we don't have privacy then we do not have for example the right to free speech it has a direct impact on that it has a direct impact on our lives in today's day and age given how much data we generate and how much data is connect collected about us given our connected lives we are data in a sense you know every minute every conversation that we have we are uh, releasing information about ourselves and now that is being captured so just think about a message that you might send or a conversation you might have online uh, there is information about how much time you are spending on that conversation what you are saying who you are talking to what your location is i mean i think i remember reading somewhere that different platforms can- let something like 20 to 30000 data points about you and okay. some of these we can't even imagine what they might be but you know another example is that someone had asked facebook for their data in the eu uh, under their law and i think they got some uh, 17 gb of data about themselves and oh, so wow. uh, the amount of data that 
we generate and and people collect about us it has an impact on us so that's from a pure privacy as a rights perspective yeah um and then you have uh, data security uh, as a part of privacy in which it's about how secure is the data that is collected about you um how what kind of control you might have over it if uh, can it be taken stolen from you in some shape or form without your consent and even you know when people have collected the data about you how secure is that yeah and then uh, there is this as- aspect of data governance which is the control that you have over your data in terms of who you release it to but broadly if you think about it we are essentially in today's day and age data uh, you know if you go back to the matrix and the movies you'll see you remember how each individual in that in that matrix is is shown by bits and bytes and data points yeah. essentially right so i think we're moving to here we are <laughs> towards a virtual world but even otherwise there is just everywhere we go everything that we do there is information that is collected about us and that's that's the fundamental aspect of privacy in terms of our right to determine what happens to our data because that has a direct impact on what happens to us mm. so i think you raise an important point in terms of you know setting out the the definition nikhil which is that data privacy and data security are two different things you know we were talking about the rights of an individual what is the purpose of this collection of data what are my privacy preferences all of that let me ask you an additional question though which is that at least within the indian context often mm-hmm. conversations around data privacy are seen as a, as elitist conversations you know where people mm-hmm. say it's not a big deal you know all this data is out in the public domain anyway so you know if 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 somebody has it or if it's placed from one platform to the other what's the big deal uh, how do you respond to to that kind of narrative so if if you think about it um in the question of agency given how right. much agency we might have uh, we would like to restrict access to our data it's people who don't have the agency that have no that have, don't have the opportunity or the freedom to restrict access make to a choice data. yeah yeah, yeah. who don't have the choice that don't exercise it so it's elitist in the sense that that when you look at it that people with more agency have more ability to exercise that choice but it doesn't mean that nobody wants that choice see um, you know there is also this conversation that i remember in the early days of conversations around privacy maybe about 6 7 years ago people used to say india is such a social country today when you're sitting with someone on a train they'll know your entire uh, life history by the time you're done with that journey but we always have some information that we don't broadcast to everyone something yeah. that's private to us something yeah. so for example it could be for you know even let's say a young adult might not want to tell their parents who they're dating at this point in time so uh, someone might not want to disclose their health record and broadcast them to the world so privacy isn't just an elitist context it's a, a concept is also about uh, our ability to control what we share and it's also about trust so yeah. if you're using a platform and uh, you know you're sometimes sharing your medical reports with with someone you don't want that put in a group with let's say thousands of people right right so there are still aspects of privacy that we want to control uh, there are aspects of our data that we don't want to share um, and privacy is fundamental to that so you know so what would sensitive personal data cover nikhil i mean you know it would be your passport your financial information your health records like you said your sexual orientation maybe you know uh, biometrics which is huge now i mean what can i what can i claim as mine that is not open to access and use by by any other without my consent i i think it's a question of choice what is it that you should be able to give um and what is it that people should be able to collect from you should be determined by you mm. because one you know when you look at things that might be sensitive or not sensitive in today's day and age what is data about you that is not sensitive maybe your name mm. but then if you take every aspect and you start connecting it to various data sets 
right? When you start layering this data one one thing upon another, upon another, upon another, by itself, each item might not mean much to you, but collectively, it can be used to profile you. And that's how the world has evolved. That uh, you know, platforms have taken some data from you directly. Like you know, when you sign up for a platform. They might say, "Let us help you connect to your friends better, and so let us give, <laughs> give access familiar. to your contact list. Right? Yeah. Give access to your contact list, and then they pull all of that data, so they're able to to create that network uh, yeah. at the back end about whose number you might have. But like, I think my wife was talking about this particular new app that we were trying out, hmm. and what it did was that it took access to your contact list and then added people to it directly, uh, but also did not. Give you the opportunity, like the moment someone signed up, they could see your updates. Oh. But she was saying that if you think about it, uh, on on her mum's phone, for example, every sabzi wala and you know dood wala and all of that, in their contacts are there. Yeah. And if they sign up for that, and the the nature of our uh, you know even shopkeepers, the nature of our our connect connected cells these days is that. Everyone has a device. Everyone can sign up for a new app, yeah. and you don't necessarily want them to see, you know, the, your photographs of your home, where you're traveling, who you're dining out with, where you're dining out with. So that ability to control access, uh, you know, so I mean, I, I I just think that that at the end of it, privacy is about control. It's yeah. about how much control you have and who you can share something with and when and how. which is a great segue into where the the law stands in terms of data privacy laws uh, i mean india doesn't have a comprehensive legislation you know we have the it act and then the amendment act 2008 but um why has the law been working with such a lag on on data privacy issues i mean personally i think it's because the government doesn't really want this law they've been dragging their feet on this law for a very very long time now yeah. and i think at some level the the indian government fundamentally believes that data is a national asset uh, we've heard you know ministers and people talk about uh, data is a new oil you heard everyone from nandan nilikani who who talked about india being a data rich country before it is an economically rich country you had mukesh ambani talk about data as being the new oil and so i i think there is this fundamental idea that data is critical to india's economic growth and therefore we need to make sure that it gets leveraged for economic growth and privacy essentially becomes antithetical to that it becomes adversarial with this particular aspect and so you know at some level i think the government doesn't they want to delay a data protection law as much as possible uh, we saw this in case of aadhar as well you know when there was a court case in the supreme court regarding aadhar the indian government went to court uh, and at that time i think there was there was about 65 or 70 odd percent penetration of aadhar in the country and they went to court and argued that privacy isn't a fundamental right and to me it looked like they wanted that case to drag on and it, yeah. i think there were almost 700 days before the privacy is as a fundamental right sort of issue came up before the supreme court but that entire hearing dragged on for over 2 years um before it was even heard and then you know uh, furthermore because uh, the government wanted to delay any ruling on privacy and any ruling on aadhar so that more and more people would get aadhar by then and so you can't delink privacy and aadhar uh, because they're historically connected be we have a data we have uh, the supreme court has recognized and said that privacy was always a fundamental right uh, it was a 9 0 uh, judgment and that happened because our government argued that it isn't a fundamental right so i think there is an ulterior motive to dragging their feet on the data protection bill uh, so that more people are forced to get uh, aadhar get a unique health id get Uh, and more databases are created because then they become a fait accompli, uh, and by then it's too late to destroy some of these databases, which is what we had with Aadhaar as well. Are there global examples of a country that has 
you know, struck the right note or found the right balance with regards to data privacy, Nikhil, because, I'm, you know, we'll talk about this later in the conversation. At this point, it's very much a state versus individual kind of situation, right, where mm. the biggest um, manipulator, if you will, of data privacy uh, happens to be the state. I, I would actually disagree with that. I think the biggest manipulator okay. of, of data globally are companies. Oh, wait, yeah. Uh, but they are the, so, yeah. But, but that doesn't mean that the state isn't trying to catch up to them. So we'll get to that. But first, from a like this, this global conversation on privacy began because of a few technological changes that took place, uh, where, for example, mm -hmm. globally storage costs went down and uh, the ability to collect more and more data, uh, the ability to process data, the cost of processing and storage of data. Uh, went down quite rapidly uh, towards the end end of 2010, you know, um, um, uh, of, of the first decade of this particular millennium. Uh, and then they've been going down ever since. And because of this, artificial intelligence and machine learning developed further, which allows for processing of, of, of more and more data faster and therefore targeting of people with advertising. So I, I blame the advertising industry for the mess that we are in with privacy because if you think about it you know there's there's an old advertising saying right uh, i know that 50 percent of my marketing budget is going waste uh, the problem is i don't know which 50 percent mm -hmm. uh, because advertising and marketing has historically been very you know let's blast this information out there and hope that something comes up and then you evaluate the effectiveness of that post facto but uh, with digitization, with personalization, with sharper targeting and the usage of tech to be able to understand you better, uh, pl platforms have been able to do demographic and psychographic profile of individuals. The Cambridge Analytica scandal that happened was because there was this psychographic profiling that took place. Russia meddling with the US elections happened because they were able to do psychographic uh, targeting of people to try and direct them to vote or not vote or feel a certain way. Uh, in 2012, Facebook ran an experiment where, you know, they could show certain, they could figure out which updates to show people to make them happy or sad on the platform, right? So this kind of granular targeting, which emerged, uh, you know, which has emerged is what has led us to the mess we are in. And we've been profiled in ways that we can't even imagine. Like our, uh, like Google's advertising is based on trying to identify what your intent might be to show you the right ad so that the conversion is better, so that an advertiser's expenditure uh, yields better results by spending less. Facebook's is more around psychographic profiling and demographic profiling and targeting again, so that the ads, ad money that an advertiser spends is utilized better, there's less wastage in a sense, right? So that's brought us to where we are. And it's because of this global market failure in privacy, um, where we've essentially all been compromised because of all the data that's been collected about us, all the profiling that's happened about us, that's led us to the situation where they are now, there's a call for data protection laws across the globe. Um, you know, like I remember like one, one thing that I'd written around, around Cambridge Analytica was the fact that we are dependent on the benevolence of platforms to not harm our democracies. There are no laws that protect us. Uh, and it's only because a platform chooses not to harm us that we are not harmed. And Facebook's experiment with, you know, making people happy or sad is an indication that these things can happen. So that's why, you know, we need greater protection from companies. And that's what most data protection bills do. But given that today there are governments that think of themselves as service providers, you're also in a situation where they're trying to, um, you know, also profile citizens as much as possible. So you have various states in India, for example, like you have the Bhamasha database in Rajasthan, you have databases in in Tamil Nadu, in, in, in Telangana, where 
uh, the the intent was to build 360 degree profiles of citizens uh, in order to better cater the delivery of government services to them. But that also has repercussions from an electoral perspective, which is why we're also concerned about this plan to link Aadhaar with, um, you know, with the voters ID, uh, yeah. because there's profiling that can happen and it probably is happening at the back end. Uh, I remember there was a case that was filed by the YSR Congress in during the 2019 elections against the TDP in, uh, because there was an allegation that an IT services firm that was working with the government, which was the TDP government, then had allegedly also taken Aadhaar data from the government and was using it to uh, run marketing campaign for the elections. So the scale of the profiling that's happening both at the company level as well as a government level um, can be used to manipulate us um, as citizens, as customers, and, and that's what we need to protect against. Mm. So I want to go deeper with the role of state. But before that, you know, Nikhil, you raised such an important point about uh, what organizations have done in terms of data privacy, right? Whether it's Facebook or Google or uh, some of the many arms that Facebook now owns. What's the way around this? Um, there's been so much talk about breaking it up, you know, break up these organizations, make them smaller so that they don't have so much of a hegemony. Uh, alternatively, this call for stepping away from social media platforms. What's the way around this with these sort of social media platforms and these organizations so deeply entrenched in our lives that, uh, frankly, it's difficult to think of how you can completely disentangle from it? I think you can't because, you know, some of these organizations, you look at the way Google restructured as Alphabet mm. uh, to create multiple companies but then they can always have independent deals with each other to do this data sharing as well. You know, so I, I don't think breaking up companies is really going to be a significant sort of solution to this problem. At one level, I think we need to, con to have regulations to control the power of the platforms. Um, and there are no easy answers here, but platforms exercise this power through their algorithm, so there needs to be algorithmic accountability. They run political marketing campaigns, uh, which can impact democracy, so there needs to be accountability there. Broadly, it lies around uh, you know, doing a deeper analysis of what gives platforms their power in terms of both advertising, in terms of data collection, and transferring some of that agency to users. The regulations have often given the state more power versus the platforms. And I think that's a dangerous path to go down because, you know, like you see with China, they have complete control over their platforms. And so uh, if you give the state too much agency, then that ability to use the platforms towards their own end, and, you know, not all states are benevolent, uh, is too risky. So you need to have institutional mechanisms put in to control the power of platforms, but also to give users more control over their data. So you should be able to, for example, periodically wipe your data from a platform if you want. You should be able to port your data from one platform to the other. You should be able to demand uh, information on what uh, data a platform has collected about you, on how you're being targeted, um, and uh, the ability to not be profiled uh, in a manner that is not essential to the delivery of the service. So if I'm, a, I'm on an educational platform and I'm getting, they're making recommendations regarding which course I should do next or what my weaknesses are and what I need to do, their profiling is useful. Not all profiling is bad. But at another level, um, if let's say, there is uh, discriminatory profiling taking place, then uh, in a sense that based on my, let's say, social economic background or on my understanding of a particular language or which religion, caste, or part of the world I be belong to, uh, I'm being discriminated against, those kind of things need to be stopped. So it's not, there are no easy answers, unfortunately, Mithali, because it's just... There's so many variables at play um, yeah. 
and you there is uh, there there is benefit to behavioral targeting and profiling and there are harms that can be caused so you need to regulate for the harms but also find a way so that the benefits don't get reduced you know i mean we are connected on these platforms uh, and we see a lot of hate speech we see a lot of spam we see a lot of trolling we see electoral manipulation taking place on all of these platforms but does that mean that there is no benefit that we gain out of being there shutting down the platforms or breaking them up doesn't necessarily solve the problem um we need to create an environment where there's more competition and that competition needs to be towards providing better services to us uh, without compromising our privacy and our data and again no easy answers to this the world is finding more problems and trying to find more solutions as we go along so let me pivot back to the state and before i talk no. about the very prickly issue of the data protection bill anikhil i want you to sort of briefly walk people who are listening through the pegasus uh, episode uh, no. and and you know what what silo you would put that into now because that's you know that takes a quantum leap from data privacy into data snooping i'm i'm in your device Mm. and i'm actually looking at what you're doing uh which is which is next level and only possible through state machinery right well it is also possible without state machinery i mean i remember one of the things i was worried about when i was in college in, in towards the end of the 90s mm. and uh, we were worried about key loggers being put on on the on cyber in cyber cafes because someone could take your username and password you take that to another level uh, two decades later and the the scariest thing about something like a pegasus is the fact that it is a zero click install which means i won't even know that it's been installed yeah. because i haven't clicked on a link to install it someone could just give me a missed call or someone could just send me a message i don't even need to access that message and or or you know respond to that missed call it will install pegasus on my device the this is uh, the worst kind of of espionage that's taking place globally and these are cyber weapons that are in use uh, and uh, with pegasus specifically that it's the state that ns the nso group it sells this only sells them to the state and right. so they are being used by states against people uh now they could be against terrorists they could be against activists against journalists and there is no control over who they are being used against yeah. and i think what's most important here is that we need to build in mechanisms for accountability because today you know even under the data protection law that is in draft stage in india there is a pretty much a carte blanche uh, exemption to the government to do what it wants with our data but also to run they can exempt certain agencies uh which can use mechanisms like like pegasus uh to surveil people and once uh, the thing is that on your device your data is unencrypted it's when it is sent to someone else when you're messaging on whatsapp from one uh, when you're sending them a message then even whatsapp can't use it but on their device and yours it's accessible so yeah. one part is that software like pegasus give people the ability to read everything on your device uh to see what's in various software to see what files you have to see what messages you're sending the other part of it is that they also have a write ability which means that they can write to your device and from a security perspective they can plant evidence against individuals and they won't even know that it's on right. their device so very very risky and uh, i hope that the supreme court will hold the government accountable uh for the surveillance that has happened um in india because you know effectively whatever evidence we are seeing uh, from the depositions that are public so far before the technical committee in the supreme court um there is there seems to be this thing that the indian state has surveilled has surveilled its own citizens and uh, many of them journalists and activists and people asking for electoral reforms uh, and opposition party good. members and you know yeah yeah and this is personal for me because uh, professor jagdeep choker who was whose name came up in the list is my uncle and uh, uh, he was he was also being surveilled uh, 
under Pegasus. And uh, yeah. I think he's he's one of the people who has deposed as well here. Yeah. And several female journalists, I might add, which is a complete uh, invasion of privacy, of their safety and security. It's, it's also, Nikhil, that, you know, with this data conversation that the virtual is spilling into the physical, you know. We've seen a couple of uh, states and cities go through this chest thumping process saying we will have the maximum number of CCTVs across our yes. city. But uh, again, this is a double-edged sword, right? No, it, it is. I remember, you know, around 2013, 14, just before the those elections, I was on a Google Hangout that Milan Dura, the then Minister for State for IT, was doing. And I asked him then about the systems that are being set up and they were being set up at the Congress uh, at that time. Uh, there was the centralized monitoring system, which is in operation now, uh, which basically is used to monitor and can be used to monitor phone calls and 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 text messages. Uh, there is also uh, there's, there was also something called Netra, which was a social media monitoring system, which is again, I believe, still in operation. And then there was this plan for a really scary system called NAGRID, uh, which is the National yeah, yeah. Intelligence Grid, yeah. which at that point in time was looking to connect some 21 various databases together for real-time information. And most importantly, these were both public and private databases. Now, the phase two plan for NADGRID was to expand it to, I think, about over 900 public and private databases. So if you think about NADGRID in the context of the data protection bill, which gives an exemption to the government, you have a situation where the government could ask any private company to give them real-time access to data under NADGRID so that they can snoop on a particular individual without being governed by the law um, and take data from all sorts of sources uh, across the board, uh, which is why you're also seeing, for example, the IT rules which came out last year, which said, which tried to create an environment where WhatsApp will not be able to provide end-to-end -end encryption because uh, they want to be able to snoop into WhatsApp conversations as well. What the centralized monitoring system can do is snoop on your SMSs and where they've hit a roadblock is because they can't snoop on your WhatsApp messages or your signal messages. So, you know, as such, the government wants the ability to access everyone's data all the time without any regulatory oversight of sorts or only their own regulatory oversight without independent parliamentary or judicial oversight um, because uh, you know national security is a significant concern in India but there are no limitations or there's no graded sort of you know um, principles or even laws or regulations that have been put in saying that when you want to access a person's data this for this level of data data access, you need this kind of authorization. Under these circumstances, you can access this data from these databases. Um, and uh, we are basically open to surveillance all the time. And from, an, from a democratic point of view, I think that should be most worrying because uh, all of us are fair game then. All opposition parties are fair game for the government. Uh, so, so you're seeing this, this entire centralization take place. And at the and the linchpin here, uh, the most important aspect here is Aadhaar, because yeah. the idea behind Aadhaar is to do deduplication, and that's why you're seeing this move to link everything to Aadhaar, because otherwise, in a country like ours, how do you differentiate one Ram Kumar from another Ram Kumar? Right, right. It's a very common name. So, so because of migration, because of uh, you know, multiple identities and ration cards and all of that complication, it was never able, it was always difficult for government, for the government to give rations and know that there is no, no, no stealing taking place. Aadhaar was meant to be a solution to this, but really what's the solution for is this deduplication for mass surveillance uh, because the systems are being put into place. Um, and then, uh, with the ability to collect data from all of these sources uh, with deduplication, de 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 they'll know more about uh, every individual um, uh, 
which for me is uh, a pathway to uh, an, an authoritative uh, regime because the impact that that can have on elections is quite significant. This is why we need to be very, very worried about the linkage of vote, voter ID to Aadhaar um, because that's the other part of it, right? The 360-degree the profiling of each individual, but also real-time profiling. Um, and of course, the other thing that's happening is that uh, there is a move to do uh, to uh, to set up video cameras uh, by the ECI for for, for elections, uh, which should also be worrying, uh, you know, given the fact that then the, the the secrecy of the ballot gets impacted. Yeah, no, I think worrying would be an understatement for that one. Uh, you know, which brings us round to the personal data protection bill, Nikhil. Started off in 2019, back in 2021, uh, multiple consultations, changes in the Joint Parliamentary Committee. But the version that we have, or, or that was presented in December last year, had a lot of people uh, quite worried about, you know, w- what it had to put out. Do you, do you want to go bit by bit in terms of what your concerns with it are? Uh, because there are many, right? In Starting off right with the objectives. Well, I, I, from the objectives perspective, it's quite simple. The, there are competing objectives for the government. At one level, they view uh, data as a national asset, like, as as oil, and yeah. they want to use this data to uh, further uh, the economy. Um, and the, the, which means basically what they want is generation of more data, collection of of more data, prof, more, more profiling. Uh, yeah. And on the other side, uh, there is privacy. So yeah. when you have competing objectives for uh, for both the bill as well as data protection authority, yeah. uh, and uh, you have a government who's argued against the fundamental right to privacy, we know where what the intention is. I, I, and when you have a privacy bill thing to ensure the interest and security of the state, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So 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 one part is uh, you know competing objectives, but also. Mm-hmm. You have uh, you the government also wants to control more data um, and wants more data to remain within the country um, because it sees this as an economic asset, which is why you have provisions that might enable data localization, um, which then impact the global nature of the internet in terms of our ability to you know buy services from anywhere in the world. Today, when you run a website or you run an app. You are taking, you're using thousands of services globally, uh, which, and and so therefore there is data moving in and out of the country, but some of this might get impacted really badly once there's localization because you know the people might choose businesses might choose not to localize data in India, so one is of course from that standpoint, but there are as an example you know there is this what by by. Just by the construct of this bill, there is a very weak data protection authority that is being created. So if you want an authority to protect our rights, and you first you give it competing uh, goals, and then um, you basically give the government complete control over the data protection authority, uh, which means that uh, under the current, uh, at least uh, version that's come out, uh, the data protection authority also have has not just has to abide by the policies that the government creates, but it also has to abide by the directions that are given to it by the government, which means that it's not going to be an independent data protection authority. And so they can't necessarily act independent of the government, which is a problem given that the government today has more data on us than any other entity. And it's looking to collect more and more data and historically, some of the biggest data breaches that have happened have happened by government departments. If you remember all the Aadhaar leaks that were taking place during, you know, 2013, 14, 15, yeah. where, you know, I think the first one that I remember was that the data of school children and their Aadhaar details had been published by a school in Telangana uh, yeah. or Andhra at that time. So, you know, uh, for, for government departments to... Uh, largely be over and above this uh, is 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 a big problem and the independence of the authority is going to be a big concern i spoke with the the first and the current chairman of the data protection authority of the philippines a few months ago 
And he said that the first case that they took up by design, because theirs was an independent authority, was against the Election Commission of Philippines, uh, because their data had been stolen twice uh, in quick succession, and they had not done enough to secure the data. And so they took that as the first case and as a huge case, because one, they, they needed to be punished, and two, uh, they wanted to give people the confidence that nobody is above board over here. Nobody can is is beyond, uh, you know, feeling the wrath of the of the data protection authority. The government isn't above board. In India, that's not going to be the case, and that's that's one one part about one the lack of independence, but also exemptions for the government, uh, which allow them to collect take data from private parties. So if you if we are using Zoom. Um, the government can effectively demand data from Zoom. You know, there is going to be no consent required from us. There is going to be no, we won't be informed about the fact that the government has demanded this data. How they use the data is up to them. Uh, so big, big, big concerns around government access to data. The other part that I worry about a lot is, is for children. Uh, you know, growing up with the internet, we've all used you know, the internet when we were 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, and the age of consent uh, in India for using the internet and uh, for data protection is uh, is 18 years of age, which means that for services, uh, they need to verify every individual to see whether they uh, uh, whether they're below 18 and they'll have to take parental consent uh, to allow them to use a service. And there's also a restriction on any kind of tracking or profiling of that individual, uh, which is going to make education apps very, very difficult to run in this country. There's going to be exclusion of children. And from my conversations with people who work particularly with girls is that they already have so many restrictions in terms of their access to devices for their learning. Uh, this is going to disenfranchise them even more. Um, so that's, uh, I, I think children are being being dealt a, a really bad hand uh, with this bill and the government should reconsider this. Apart from that, there is, of course, uh, I mean, there are lots of minor issues, small, small issues with the bill, but uh, I think uh, the inclusion of something called non-personal data uh, yeah. is tricky. And uh, while the government, while you know, members of the committee that I've spoken with said that the idea was that even non-personal data should have privacy guarantees because you know you can layer this data on personal data. So, for example, data about uh, what kind of food is eaten in which pin code and in what quantity can be layered on top of personal information to understand you know what are the food habits of an individual because they belong to a particular pin code right so this is a this might seem like a innocuous use case but you can also correlate some of some food habits to particular religions community um, profiling yeah yeah for, for 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 community profiling and then as you keep adding more and more data from more and more layers of data from different places this this what might seem to be anonymized aggregate data uh, can actually be used to profile people uh, quite strongly. So the committee wanted to include non-personal data in this because they believe that it requires privacy protections. But the way our country is looking at non-personal data might have intellectual property concerns. So as a business, if I've you know created certain cohorts and profiles because I want to target a particular set of customers in a particular manner, that's metadata. And then for there to be the way India is looking at it is that there has to be an authority in case, in this case, the data protection authority, which might, and, and a particular structure with data trusts where that data could be given to third parties. And so all being take all they could be taken by the government uh, again, without the consent for that data. So how this data is going to be used um, is we're not really sure. And this non-personal data conversation globally is very nascent. So I think we're sort of hurrying into this right now. 
Although I do think that the point about in privacy protection for non-person data is a legitimate one, and it could apply to all data. I don't think the committee really needed to segment personal and non-personal data over here. Let me ask this as a conclusion to our chat, Nikhil, because I mean, I know I, I, that's not the intent of our chat, but there is a degree of helplessness that one feels um, having heard this. You know, you talk to institutions from a business perspective about how there will be multiple positive impacts by putting emphasis on data privacy. You can talk to states about the importance of personal rights and privacy, but ultimately you're up against very, very large and well-oiled machinery. Uh, as an individual, you know, what are my choices or options over here with regards to my data and how private I want to keep it? Well, I, I, I think we're taking a step in the right direction. Uh, you know, the people who've argued that, look, Facebook knows everything about you, or Google knows everything about you, so why are you worried about sharing this data with other people. Uh, but like I said earlier, it's about being able to have some amount of control over the data about who you share it with, what they can do with it. So there are aspects to data protection like purpose limitation, that it can be only used for a particular purpose and it would be a violation of the law if, that, if they go beyond that purpose. There is the importance of consent that you will only take this data if I allow you to take it. I give you the written, like there's a recorded consent that I'm allowing you to take this data from me. Right? So there's some amount of agency that we need to get uh, in order to be able to exercise our rights because you're right. Today, we are helpless in terms of how much data is being collected about us through CCTVs, through various places that we go to, through uh, the apps that we use, through um, electoral mechanisms. Look at historically the way Aadhaar has worked. Man, for most of us, our data has been forced from us because regulations have been made in that manner. Now, the, a data protection bill is not going to be, uh, it's not going to completely solve this problem for us as, as individuals, but it's a necessary step in that direction. It's a first step in that direction. What's also going to have an impact is how we use the data protection bill to, uh, to enforce our agency. So we need people to go to court against companies, against the government, against people who they feel have violated their privacy uh, so that we have some amount of agency in the matter. One really important right in this is going to be the right to erasure. That I can, right. you know, I can ask someone to delete the data about me. So these are all very, very important aspects uh, of giving some rights back to us, some control back to us, uh, so that uh, we can take a step uh, towards protecting ourselves. Um, but we we'll need more. Uh, what we're seeing is that. Uh, the the level of invasion is increasing. Uh, you know, just as a small example, uh, we wrote about the Lucknow Safe City tender uh, last year, and among some of those some, some of the cases there was that they need to be able to they need CCTVs that are able, with facial recognition software that's able to recognize behavior that might be harmful to women in areas. Uh, near a woman's hostel, oh. uh, including, for example, <laughs> smoking near a, near a woman's hostel. Who determines that smoking <laughs> near a woman's hostel is behavior that's harmful to women, right? So there are... What these... is it, the women smoking outside the hostel? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. So there are th these... Uh, there is the usage of CCTV, spatial recognition, and drones. There were drones that were used using the CA and RC protests that were used to take video footage of people, right? So there are, the, the level of invasion is increasing. This is visible invasion, but there's invisible invasion that's also happening on our devices. So we need a data protection law. We need surveillance reform in this country. We need transparency and accountability of individuals. We also need to ensure that there is a limit to the centralization of data that is taking place through mechanisms like, like Aadhaar, like the unique health ID for many people, a unique health ID is being generated for them without their consent when they when they were getting vaccination. So uh, it's actually exhausting fighting each of these things bit by bit because it's happening at such a large scale and one does feel helpless. 
what will help is for people to become more aware don't give your number uh, to, you know uh, to chaios when you're buying tea uh, i always refuse they once try to yeah. take facial they once try to do facial recognition on me so you know say no to giving your data wherever possible every time someone asks yeah. for my aadhar i ask them whether another id will work uh, you know so keep keep pushing back it it will take all of us individually and not just the laws but it will take all of us individually pushing back and saying no to data collection about us that will basically make people more aware that this matters to us and yeah. so i would say that it it we can't do this we can't just depend on laws to solve our problems regarding privacy and data protection that these steps have to be taken by us by you by me by everyone listening to this uh so my suggestion is start pushing back today absolutely that's that's fantastic advice i think every time you're faced with a question about your data the question to ask is what is this for why is this necessary what are my options here um and i think to add to all your brilliant points nikhil i would just say i think people need to start thinking a bit more about this. you know it it shouldn't be uh, a completely unconscious not unconscious but a ready reaction where people ask for your data and you you have it at the at the go and ready you need to start talking more about it nikhil thank you so much it's been such a fantastic chat uh, i hope it's been great for those who are listening in as well i think we've covered some but definitely not all of what this uh, this entails so i would encourage you to read more go need ya nama read over there read whichever resource you like but uh, start reading up about data privacy and why it's important for you thank you very much nikhil thanks for joining in for this chat uh, thanks mitali thanks thanks to bic for for hosting this Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S Sarvanaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.